Alex. Alex Tsiaris uh, trained as a uh, painter and as a sculptor, and as far as I know, he's uh, medically self-taught, technologically self-taught. I first met Alex when I uh, went down to uh, Richard Werman's TED conference. We were both on the roster as speakers. We met, we hit it off. I'm pleased to say Alex <laughs> is a pal. And uh, I'll let him explain to you exactly what he does and show you his astonishing images. Pretty good. Um, at the beginning, Moses uh, introduced me as a photographer. In reality, uh, we don't do photography. I think someone shut off my computer. Let me see if I can get it back now. Um, what we do is write, it sounds a little uh, pretentious, but basically we write multidimensional algorithms for supercomputers to be able to visualize the human body. And whenever I say that, I really don't know what I'm talking about, but it sounds good. <laughs> In essence, what we do is we're mathematicians, uh, programmers, and we write programs to basically be able to look into very, very large data sets with um, lots of computing power. And this is one of the areas that the next generation of uh, visualization for cancer research and also being able to anticipate how molecular structures will indeed function. I'm going to show you uh, something from our last project, which is basically was just published by Doubleday, uh, getting a, a lot of attention on it. Uh, could you please actually dim the lights on this and bring up the sound? Dim the lights all the way down, please, on this. Can we go to this sound on this, please? The light's down entirely.
I'm going to check something because I've never seen such bad colors. What I'm looking at on the screen here is something completely different than what you're looking at. So it's, uh, it's uh, a little disturbing. But um, let me take you on to a, a small section of um, what we were working on here to actually take you through some of the imagery. Uh, basically, what you're looking at is the male reproductive system. And one of the things that's kind of extraordinary when you start looking at this piecemeal, the whole process of, from conception to birth, is just the marvel of every section along the way. The male reproductive system you know, produces every ejaculation around 300 to 500 million sperm. The numbers are mind boggling. And they go through this kind of roller coaster of the benzephrines. And basically, what happens is that they hit the seminal vesicles. And the seminal vesicles are it's strange that there's only one place in the body that actually fructose is made. And fructose is such a sweet molecule that we even have to actually dilute it for our table sugar. And it's sort of like a high energy molecular box lunch for the sperm en route to the ovum. <laughs> <laughs> and as it goes through, from there it goes into this kind of like a Willy Wonka, you know, chocolate factory, <laughs> going through all these tubes and things. Uh, then it goes into the prostate gland. The prostate actually uh, pumps in some an alkaline solution. It, it's it's extraordinary because basically it's hard to conceive of your own biochemical evolutionary process, but this is anticipating the acidity of the woman's body, so it's going to neutralize her vagina so that it makes it actually a, a friendlier environment for the sperm uh, for the insemination. And then it comes down into this area, which is a culper gland, which is sort of a lubricant. It's sort of like you're walking around with your own K, KY jelly in a way. <laughs> and it's really quite extraordinary that these kinds of systems are all being sort of anticipated for the woman's reproductive systems. If anyone is familiar with this data set, it's quite famous because it's from the visible human. Oh, you're not? Oh, that's strange. You have been watching? Oh, God, someone speak up somewhere. <laughs> the, uh... Ah, OK, you're back. Sorry. Strange. OK, so you didn't see any of this. <laughs> OK. Well, there's a penis and a couple of <laughs> testicles. <laughs> Just do it again, don't worry. Okay. Uh, well, fundamentally here, these, um, the testicles, one of the things that's interesting about this data set is that it's from the National Library of Medicine the, at the National Institute of Health. And um, it's quite well known in the industry, in the biz <laughs> of scientific visualization, because he didn't have a left testicle. And what we did is we gave him one back. Um, so when the National Institute of Health came and said, why did we do that? We simply said, because we could. Um, <laughs> And so in that cartoon that we saw earlier of the testicles of the dog, if the dog wants them back, come to us. <laughs> Next part is the, I mean, the female reproductive system is just magnificent. And there's all this conversation going on, you know, from the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland. Here you have the beauty of the ovaries actually descending the fallopian tube into the, into the uterus, the magnificence of the kind of the curvature of uh, the vagina in order to accommodate uh, the penis here is like the ovaries, and it's, what's happening is that the luteinizing hormones and the follicle-stimulating hormones are being sent from the pituitary gland down to the ovaries. The ovaries are then sending estrogen, so that basically what's happening is that as we have a kind of a cross-section of the woman's uterus, it's creating kind of a buffer, a place that's sort of comfortable for the egg to come and sit in as it descends down. This is, um, you know, the moment of the 300 to 500 million sperm that actually take off. Only a few hundred of them make it. And as they sort of try to burrow in, it's like a 30-foot wall, and it's just this kind of protective layer. But the moment one of them makes it in, it's this beautiful kind of shimmering, kind of depolarization of the egg itself. And it's like the egg is saying, I'm sated with DNA. I need no more. And it blocks all the other sperm out. One of the things that continues to go on, of course, is that the sperm will, for days, continue to try to get in. We refer to it as a kind of a bad fallopian tube singles bar, but <laughs> these guys are like, like <laughs> these guys are like chumps on bar stools. You know, they still haven't gotten the point. <laughs> One of the things we finally realized that even at the cellular level, it's a guy thing. <laughs> This is a kind of extraordinary moment, because here is all the, the DNA from the father and the DNA from the mother. And it's basically merging at that moment to give the child its genetic information. So once this happens, the metabolism of the, of, of the, the 
potential baby. It just takes off. This is what is considered the classic stem cell. Now, it's already separated. We're only into five or six days, but it's already separated. Here are these beautiful cells that are called trophoblast cells. And trophoblast cells will become the placenta and they will become the umbilical cord. And they're also the little drillers. They drill into the side of the uterus and they start sending a message. It's called human gonadotropic uh, hormone, which basically is a message back to the ovary to say, hey, start sending some some uh, estrogen and some androgen here that we need to actually create a new ecosystem and sustain it. So basically there's already this kind of chemical messaging system going back and forth. And here in the center, this clump is basically going to become the embryo. So the differentiation as it escapes from its shell will burrow in and basically start the processing of, of uh, growth. And it doesn't take very long. Within three weeks, you're already starting to see kind of the segmentation. Here is what's going to be the backbone. These will be the vertebrae, the separation of the left and right hemisphere. Here you have the yolk sac. And only, you know, we're, we're now into, I mean, four weeks. And look at, you have the beginning of the ear, the eye, the lower jaw, the neck. Uh, the heart is already there, the left and right hemisphere, the somites, which actually will become the vertebrae. And we were looking at it and saying, it's just amazing how, how quickly it happens. But we also asked the question, because it's such a beautiful kind of architectural structure, that we decided to do a, our next book is called The Architecture and Design of the Human Body. We looked at this and we said, what will this look like when it grows up? We said, here is like the perfect vertebrae and being able to see all the nerve endings come out so you can actually start to see what the dermatomes indeed will look like. I'm going to skip ahead because uh, there's really so much to show you. One of the fascinating things is that uh, how everyone, how every cell knows what to become. There's a kind of an induction process which is actually dictated by the brain. And the brain at this point is like 60% of the body. But since it happens actually from the head down, you can actually see the hands are developing three or four days earlier than the foot. And there's this process where they're basically it's just communicating to each other so very quickly. That's the thing is that when you try to conceive of the numbers, every cell is like saying, I'm going to be a liver cell, I'm going to be a retina cell, and, you know, the kind of conversation. But the numbers are so unimaginable that someone once uh, made the analogy, it's like sitting at the bottom of Niagara Falls trying to contemplate counting every drop and knowing where it's supposed to be and where it's supposed to go. That's how quickly this is all happening. Now, one of the things about multidimensional visualization is that it allows you, once you compile the data, you have the ability to do anything you want with it in the sense that I can then just travel through it because it's actually multidimensional. It's not just a, a, a picture. Photograph is a wonderful record of an image from a specific point of view. When you have volumetric data, you can travel through it. It's basically like owning the real estate. And once we actually start to segment the data, which means identify separating objects from the whole, then we can actually turn those objects into different, like in this case, we turn the, uh, the skin into glass so I could actually see through it. You want to see in developmental biology, what is the norm? How do these things indeed develop? I wanted to see the vascularization. So basically what I did is that I made it a Philip Johnson glass house and just basically left the skin transparent. But the next time what I wanted to do is keep it in the same position, but I wanted to see how the nervous system was actually growing inside it. In this case, the, um, we can also turn objects on and off in multidimension, turn the heart on, turn. I can actually watch how these things develop, separate them and control them from the whole. One of the most important things though, that as you start to see this information is why people actually separate the embryo from the fetus. This is the uh, last stage of the embryonic development. At eight weeks, in essence, the baby's made. Everything is in its position. We're at the tail end of the eight weeks and already the three lobes on the right lung are already there. Now, one of the fascinating things is watching the conversation that's happening in the body at this point. If, on your right lung, you have three lobes. On your left lung, you only have two lobes. And a week before this happens, basically the heart is protruding out into the left side of, uh, of, the, of the left lung. And it's sitting there saying, hey, I need some room to grow here. Basically, the architecture and structure will actually accommodate each organ and system. And it's having a conversation all the time. The umbilical cord is in, in the placenta. The placenta is a really unsung hero. I mean, basically, it's a, it's a heart-lung machine. It brings uh, antibodies. It has all this kind of information, and it really protects the child during that period of time. And it's a, it's a really beautiful, fundamentally beautiful structure. One of the things that also is extremely interesting is that in the, from the eighth week on, when we stop calling it an embryo and it becomes a fetus, the real thing that happens is that it really simply enlarges and details. Now here is a baby at six months. 
the brain, everything is in place, but there's none of that folding, the jirai and the sukai that make up the kind of classic folds of the, of the adult brain. That will all happen between six months and the first six months of, of after birth. And that folding will hold six times more memory, processing power, um, emotions, and all of that will happen within one year period from this point on until the first six months of birth. One of the things that we did that was important for us was to design a new technology. So we wrote multi-dimensional, again, algorithms, which basically allows us to take spiral CT data set and take 4D ultrasound information. And we wrote these systems that you could actually map them and watch the, the baby actually give birth. Uh, so this is real human data. This is the first time this has ever been done. But we wanted to actually see this entire process in real time. The curious thing is, in the end, the epiphany, of course, is the birth of the child. It is quite an extraordinary moment. Um, it was particularly poignant for me because the last picture of the book was, was uh, uh, my son, uh, who was, um, my wife was pregnant during the time of, uh, we were working on this. And though my wife has a tendency of dressing our son so he looks like a hybrid of a little Buddha and the youngest member of the KKK, um, <laughs> her fashion sensibilities to the side. Uh, one of the things that is, makes you sort of marvel is that you have kind of a front row seat to Genesis. You're sitting there marveling at the magic of the machinery that made him and sort of the privilege. But at the same time, when you're working intensely in these areas, you realize that you're always of two minds. Um, I'm principally trained as a painter and a sculptor, and then I became a journalist, and then from a journalist, I also became a scientist. And in that, you have many voices of which you are responsible for. One, as a scientist and a journalist, your job is to provide information. But when you see things go wrong and when you you're touched by them, you realize that there's something that transcends the event itself, the, the, the mathematical models. And we're extremely fluent in the office, uh, in the lab, when we're speaking about the mathematical formulas in relationship to this. But when we're speaking about it in relationship to our own emotions, it was you just really couldn't find words. And you had also mixed emotions, like there are times where it just didn't work out. The, the many trillions of cells did not go to the right place and basically the baby died. And cases like that, you know, I looked at him sitting there saying, I, I made a series of artworks, which um, we're, we're proposing that will be at the Museum of Modern Art next year. I've been um, at a number of gallery shows in this last few months of kind of the the ambiguity of your feelings about all of this. I mean, when I look at this, I don't know whether I'm feeling about the beauty of the biomechanics of the skeletal system during birth, or is it just the haunting element that these, they died, and in essence, we're looking at the remnants of what could have been so much hope. So we look at this kind of information, and we realize the fact that art and the science part of it are all intertwined. When you take a look at, at beautiful anatomical renderings throughout history, whether you take a look at Da Vinci, Dor, Versalius, Rembrandt's paintings of surgery, one of the things that you really understand immediately is that they are quantitatively accurate, but they're beautiful. That's why they last the test of time. Every hospital in the country has an audiovisual department where they're simply making records, and they're lost. The thing that transcends it is the beauty. It's the beauty of the moment. It's the respect for this kind of fundamental information that speaks to you on many levels. One is a kind of the bizarreness of you know, birth and the kind of awe-inspiring moment of it simultaneously. And that's what we try to do in the office. We try to bring this beauty that we see in this data. And data is, uh, people think of if you have data, data is data. But basically, data is like Monet's haystacks. You could have. 10 artists in front of Monet's haystacks, and if Monet was there, you'd get only one Monet. It's how you interpret. There are millions of judgment calls on how you actually treat the data. That's a critical part. And we love our data, because the thing is that what we see is just beautiful, beautiful information that speaks to us on many, many, many levels. Now, I want to come back to some of the issues of the technology, which seems to baffle people. Um, but one of the people who actually explained it better than anyone was was Oprah um, when we did the show. So I'm going to play a little segment where she talks about our technology. Combine science and medicine and powerful computers to create these stunning images. And here is how we did it. Look at that. Whenever you get data in, the space that the tissue is in always has some sort of inherent noise. Did you turn and the lights down? You have to eliminate that noise. The images come in looking much like what we've seen before as an ultrasound in black and white with lots of gray areas that don't mean much of anything to the untrained eye. 
But Alexander Ciaris and his team of 25 biologists, engineers, computer programmers, and animators can see behind the cloudy layer. By using mathematical formulas, they can separate certain shades of gray and eliminate them from the picture, revealing an incredible image for the first time ever. The gray that you're actually looking at could be amniotic fluid, it could be air, and as you're seeing, the kind of like a cloud that's just disappearing. And then there you have it, the embryos underneath. The image is a 44-day-old embryo, and layer by layer, they peel away the shades of gray to see inside the embryo it is a medical revolution. And here we're looking at the insides of all the tissues. We can use mathematical formulas to help us reveal the lung, the liver, the brain's development. To other people, it's just a bunch of darks and whites. The advantage now is the ability to go inside the tissue. Now you're looking at the inside of the spinal column, they combine individual high-quality scans, like different slices of an image, and stack them together to create the three-dimensional image. You're looking at a specimen that's no larger than a raisin. We are actually looking inside a human embryo. Remember, this is only 44 days old. In the past, you would have photographs of an object. Now, not only can we bring in three-dimensional objects, but we can start to study what's inside the object. What we're going to do now is take a part of this tissue and just turn it off so that it reveals what's inside it and underneath the surface of the skin, the heart, two eyeballs, a circulatory system, a big umbilical cord. This ability will allow doctors and scientists to monitor the development of an embryo, to look inside something that is smaller than a peanut. At stage three of the process, Alexander can take each organ and paint them in the computer, either to make them stand out for doctors to see or to make the colors look more lifelike. I can now just choose the liver and now I've made it purple. Now I can more clearly define my borders between the liver and the heart. If I want to look underneath the liver, I can just start to fade it out, and you can clearly see the stomach growing right below it. Alexander says by using this technology, surgeons will also be able to see inside a patient before they operate and plan the surgery ahead of time on the computer. It's extraordinary information that we have in front of us. Really fascinating. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. It's... Could you keep the lights on? Because the film will just continue to run. Thank you. Um, it's not enough to basically just uh, have this kind of three-dimensional information. It's critical when you're actually, when a physician is looking at it, to be able to actually diagnose uh, what's going on in the body. But basically, the body moves through time. So it was important for us to actually take it to the next step, which was to write four-dimensional algorithms and allow the tissues to move in multi-dimensional space. And that was um, a kind of a breakthrough for us. We've used it, actually, unusually. The media has asked for it as much as uh, industry and, uh, and government agencies have. Uh, this was something that we did for the, um, for the Super Bowl, for CBS, and actually simulating um, um, problems that athletes have. I mean, these guys are unbelievable. They're taking like 300 pills at the end of a game. They're put in hyperbolic chambers because they have these gigantic hematomas in order to sort of reabsorb all the blood from all the beatings. And what we wanted to do is just basically simulate some of the damages that they were doing in their body in a, a, a pre-Super Bowl game. But the uh, ability to use this information, you know, technologically, <laughs> technologically, what is important is the ability to actually simulate what goes on in the body. We're, uh, probably going to do the next uh, season's NBA game about the scanning all the all-stars in the, in the game, being able to actually take a look and travel through their bodies. Because there are some athletes in the world that are obviously great, but some are just so spectacular that there's their will to win coupled with this the biomechanics of their body is something that you want to see inside. So we're going to be launching a program for this Discovery Channel called Inside. We'll be interviewing them, trying to understand their will to win, coupled with the kind of the magic of what is going on in their bodies. But we also use these technologies for a number of other areas. Um, um, I was um, offered the position of Associate Professor of Medicine and Chief of Scientific Visualization at Yale in the Department of Surgery, and we were underwritten by NASA to do virtual algorithms in preparation for the astronauts going into deep space flight. So our job is basically to use these kinds of technologies to understand gravitational pull, uh, virtual surgeries, 
or to also use them for crash tests for, um, for car companies. So they can actually use real human data. Uh, these are massive, massive amounts of data. They look very fluid, but basically the computation that you need to actually do these is just enormous. The next part, the first part of my company is actually uh, technology. We are programmers and we're mathematicians. Basically, we write all the algorithms and code, and so it's a proprietary technology to us. The second part of uh, my company is uh, a library. We own the largest library of uh, volumetric data. This is multidimensional data in the world, probably even larger than the National Institute of Health. That's why they actually come to us to do the visualization. And what happens is that when you actually have the data, your job is to mine it, to try to figure out where is that piece of cancer, how can I move this piece of tissue. Uh, this, is, this is not only at the, at the anatomical level, but it's also at the cellular level and it's also at the molecular level. Your job is to basically be able to separate it. This is critically important when you're actually thinking in a clinical environment because in normal clinical environments, the radiologist is the first person to receive the data. And the radiologist is sort of, in the world of art, is like an abstract expressionist or a hermetic cubist. They understand a two-dimensional slice in their mind's eye and can interpolate it in 3D. And they can see your entire heart from looking at a couple of black and white slices that look extremely abstract. The problem is that the surgeon is much more like a sculptor. They love the tactile and they love the 3D. So, it's much more important to give the information to the surgeon in a language to, which they indeed understand because principally they've got the knife. And if you want them to cut you well, you should really be able to give them mappings that they understand. Simultaneously, when you have this kind of compelling information, it makes it a lot easier for the physicians to explain to people what they have. And this is one of the reasons that the third part of my company is, is a media company. We are launching uh, our own series of books, our own series of television programs in collaboration with Time Magazine, Doubleday, HarperCollins, um, many, many partners, so that basically we can actually see this data in multi-dimension. Could you bring this up? Bring the lights down, please. This needs a big screen. to increase about seven times the normal amount. This sudden influx of blood expands the sponge-like structures and produces an erection by straightening and stiffening the penis. At the molecular level, sexual arousal triggers a release of nitric oxide, which activates the enzyme glutinate cyclase. This results in a surge of cyclic GMP, a natural penile blood flow activator that governs the vigors of a man's erection during intercourse. After orgasm, under the influence of an enzyme called PDE5, cyclic GMP levels fall and a man's erections fade. Now the interesting thing is that when Viagra was trying to actually find um, this, you know, solution for this problem, they found a whole family of these PDEs and PDE5 is actually for erectile um, uh, dysfunction and PDE9 is for color blindness. So in essence what you did is you got a hard on but you saw violet. Um, <laughs> <laughs> We suggested to them that they market it in a liquor store with a good bottle of wine and Jimi Hendrix Purple Haze. <laughs> now this is a, a molecule that's never been seen this way. In essence, it's making your red blood cells. The ability to do this all, also at the molecular structure, which is one of the new technologies that we've been working on, is absolutely critical. If you want to make a drug to actually fit dock perfectly into one of these magnificent architectural structures that are either a receptor or a protein, that is, uh, is targeted, like this is a proteosome. I mean, it's absolutely beautiful symmetry to this molecule. It's the biggest protein. We were working with Millennium, and they couldn't even load it, never mind manipulate it. But this is the trash can of the body. It basically it absorbs all these other molecules, and it is absolutely a beautiful, beautiful molecule. But being able to do this not only at the gross anatomical, so that you can use it for clinical research and for, for drug research, and for you know, basically this kind of technology is is something that basically was, was coined well by Einstein where he said, solving a problem is not difficult, visualizing a problem is difficult. And that's all we do, is we visualize. Now, this is a little piece, we're doing the biggest project now on the history of, uh, it's kind of the biggest epic on cancer. It's a seven hour program and a book. Um, this is just some small snippets of the example of, like for example, colon cancer. Uh, one of the things about colon cancer is that it's extremely preventable disease and people just don't understand the consequence of it. So what we did is we wrote a new technology that actually allows you to watch a polyp over a 10 year period grow, giving you the understanding that you actually had you know, 3,650 plus days to remove this thing before you really had a problem. 
but um, people just don't understand the consequence. So we merged several technologies working with the uh, University of Southern California and the um, Norris Cancer Center and built this model so that you could actually watch a polyp grow over a 10 year period from real human data. And that's and one of the interesting things about this is that you, and you, can, you, know, you can take these polyps off. There are no nerve endings in the colon, so it's really, it's sort of painless, but uh, it looks, uh, especially from this next shot, to be a little painful, but it's actually, um, since there are no nerve endings, this can be removed very, very quickly. And of course, this was used on the Today Show and is used in another series of other programs, but the ability to see it, like this is metastasis. People always wondered, why does the, why does the cancer go to my liver? Because you've got this incredible vascularization in the digestive system that just flows directly and is processed by the liver. So if a, if a cell breaks off, as it does here, and these are just microscopic pictures of confocal laser, but you can see the chaos. This is where visualization is actually shows you the lack of symmetry is, is so prevalent in oncology, and this is one of the first things they look for. But fundamentally, we were producing this thing to sort of get people to understand that they have to go out and get a colonoscopy. Let me show you a piece also on pain. Um, fundamentally, from a media perspective, our responsibility is get you to marvel at your own existence to get you to sit there and say, my God, I cannot believe the extraordinary complexity of my body, and get you to understand when things go wrong, what are the options back to health? So this kind of visualization process can be used. I mean, there's nothing worse than being in a hospital. I spend a lot of time in children's hospital. There's nothing worse than the apprehension of parents not knowing what their kid has. And these kinds of visualization are compelling kind of educational systems that allow you to actually walk through your disease and indeed understand them. Simultaneously, they allow you to also understand the norm, because it's very hard to understand when things go wrong and what your options, if you don't indeed understand the norm. So that's what we first established, the marvel of your own existence when things are moving in a kind of a normal fashion, and then when they go wrong. And that's the way we tell a story. And that's, the, you know, we basically do it in every fashion for magazines, books, television programs, museum shows. This is the capillaries absorbing uh, the fentanyl, which is the molecule from, uh, uh, that is used. And this is, the, this is the protein, basically the receptor. It's called a mu receptor that it actually docks in to stop the pain. And then from there, it proliferates throughout the entire body. Now, I've got this, this last piece. Um, I, I've been asked a number of times by the National Institute of Health to um, key, uh, keynote their futures of scientific visualization. They were coming in from all over the world for one of their big, big meetings. So they asked me to do something that was really spectacular with one of their prime data sets, which I showed you a little bit earlier. It's the uh, visible human. It's about 15 gigabytes, and he's, the guy is a, it was a serial killer who was cut up into 1,867 slices. We refer to him as prosciutto man. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Moses, my hero. <laughs> <laughs> amazing, amazing stuff. Holy cow.